This is what I call a high Sabbath. Praise God for our children, our young people, becoming the present, not only the future, of the church. How many of you have ever watched Hope Channel? Okay. Some years ago, I used to watch a very interesting program on Hope TV, which is a branch of Hope Channel in Romania. The name of the program was Longing for Freedom. Longing for Freedom. In this program, a social worker used to interview people from prison, inmates, most of them young people. In those days, besides being a pastor, I used to also teach in high school. So those programs were very educational for me, very enlightening. You could notice a very interesting pattern. In almost every story, you had teenagers, friends, and choices. It seems that when you put all three of them together, you get the recipe for jail. <laughs> it's very interesting how this whole pattern evolved. Because in most stories, you had somebody saying, I made a bad choice here. There was a visible bad choice made here. But if you listen carefully, you would notice that before that visible bad choice there, there was an invisible bad choice made here, before that bad choice. More precisely, an invisible bad choice made in here, in the heart. In most cases, people had no idea about the invisible bad choice of that person. They only knew about the visible bad choice that got the person in trouble and then in jail. But most of those inmates were aware of the fact that before the visible bad choice, there was an invisible bad bad choice, and some people around them were aware of the invisible bad choice, too. Teenagers, friends, and choices. As a teenager myself, well, an ex-teenager, I know that can be a recipe for trouble. But at the same time, I know that can be a recipe for triumph. Take a teenager called Daniel, add some friends to it, and then put some choices in the bowl, and you have a wonderful recipe of what? Trouble or triumph? Well, trouble. It's called fiery furnace and the lion's den. Only that, when God is in the equation, when you add God to the equation of life, then trouble will start slowly but surely moving toward triumph. And that's what you have in the book of Daniel. The first chapter of the book of Daniel is like a seed and also a summary of the entire book. Because throughout the book, you have this pattern. You have trouble, then there is some transformation, tenacity is involved, and you move back down to triumph. That's the chiastic structure of the first chapter. But there is a key. There is a key to triumph. And that's Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. This is what it says. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, first part. But Daniel, say it with me, purposed. Yes, indeed, Daniel 
purpose, Daniel determined in his heart, what? That he would not defile himself. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we are here in front of your word. What a great privilege to start a journey through the book of Daniel on a high Sabbath like this. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be leading us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Daniel, right there in the first chapter, starts with big trouble. Some teenagers in year 605 B.C. are walking in chains toward a place called Babylon in the land of Shinar. What is weird about their, about their march toward Babylon is that centuries before, the father of faith, Abraham, came from that place because God called him to go to the promised land. Now it seems that these youngsters reverse the same journey of faith, going from the promised land back to Babylon. More than 600 miles. Huh. And as the rabbinic tradition explains it, the woman cheated on her husband. And now the husband sent the woman back home to the house of her father. In other words, God's people became unfaithful to God. And now God sent his people back from where they were called to come out. And if you look at the Bible passage, you will get to the conclusion that is true. Because in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, this is what it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. That is, Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Yes, God gave the king of Judah into the hands of the other king. It was a God thing. In those days when a king overcame another king, in fact, they said, the gods of this king overcome, overcame the gods of this king. So in our case, the king of Babylon conquered the king of Israel, of Judah, and uh, as a consequence, you can see that the gods of Babylon conquered the god of Judah, Yahweh himself. And normally, what they would do is they would take his images, his statues, and take them to Babylon, pointing it out to everybody, we have taken the gods of that nation into captivity. Only that, when they look for the images and statues of Yahweh, they can't find anything, because Yahweh does not have images or statues. All they can take is some vessels from the temple, but even those just because the Lord gave them. You cannot take Yahweh into captivity. Yes, God, the eternal God, Yahweh, will go to captivity, but not because He's taken. He's going there because He wants to be with His people. With, he wants to be with the captives. He is there with them in trouble. So now, look at these teenagers. Because yes, they were all teenagers. They are walking the 600 plus miles. And as dra they drag their feet into the court of the king, they feel exhausted, almost to collapse. Very sad and troublesome picture. And these kids, these youngsters, are impeccable. Look what says in verse 4. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking. Huh? Teenagers want to be good-looking. Gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. I would fit into that picture, not because of being good-looking, maybe because 
of the languages. I, I know you would fit. Yes, you teenagers. And as they drag their feet into the court of the king, there is Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz is the high-ranking official of the king. He is the, the education superintendent of the king, most probably a castrated eunuch. He looks at them. He has an eye for them already. All he has in his mind is transformation. Transformation. He looks at the king and he says, Majesty, in three years, these young people, in three years, they will be fully trained, equipped, and empowered to be able to stand before the king. Yes, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Ashpenaz, what are you going to do to them? Well, first of all, I'm going to play a little bit with their taste buds. Yes, the taste buds, those are the buttons of life, really. When they are going to taste the del delicacies and the wine coming straight from the table of the king, they will uh, really sense that this is a new, a whole new life. Yeah. And for three years, we are going to teach them our stuff. They are already good-looking and smart and uh, very capable. We are going to tap into their pride, make them even more self-conscious. And you will see that slowly but surely, they will start giving up on their values and habits. And to get them going, this is the first and most important, we are going to change their theophoric names meaning the names that carry the name of their God. Daniel, El Elohim. Mishael, El Elohim. Mishael. Azariah, from Yahweh. And Hananiah, from Yahweh. We are going to change those theophoric names into theophoric names that carry the name of our gods. We are not going to touch their religion now. We are going to work on their identity. So now what, Daniel? You've got two options. Be realistic and pragmatic. Give up your values and habits. And the bright future is awaiting, awaiting you. Or... Resist, rebel, revolt, fight back like crazy, and you will see what, what's going to happen. Pick one. What would you pick? Pretty hard. Let me give you a third option. Reluctantly swallow everything and then cry your eyes out. Just like those in Psalm 137 did. Look what they did. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept. When we remember Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. And what did you do? For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And this can get worse. Look at verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's wrong with you guys? Only, only, only anger and revenge? Do you realize that any of three, these three choices, possible choices, 
would have placed me in the situation for today to be preaching from another book because none of these stories would be in this book of Daniel. Maybe the book of Daniel wouldn't even exist. But there is a good choice. What is the good choice? Well, the good choice is to be, to be faithful. Correct. To whom? To whom? To God, yes. And to whom? To God and to the king. Oh, so you want me to compromise? No, no, no. Let me read something to you. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities as a king. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist, back, 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 please. The authorities that exist have been established by whom? Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God is, has instituted. And those who do some so will bring what? Judgment on themselves. Wow. So submit to God as a priority and also submit to, to the king. Up to the limit of sin, not including sin. Up to that limit. I'm scared to see that in our society, Christians, indeed even Seventh-day Adventists, have gotten somehow to the conclusion that now these Bible passages do not bind. They only have to be faithful to God. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you should be faithful to God and to the King. Oh yes, indeed, you have to walk a very fine line. You don't want to mess up. But if you want to take the Bible seriously, then you have to take it as it is. And that's how Daniel takes it. Chapter 1, verse 7. This is how it starts. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave or determined names. So please notice the play on words. The chief of the eunuchs determined or gave them names. Now, as a reaction, because when, when they saw their names were changed, they said, man, this is, this is transformation beyond what we can take. It is transformation beyond what we can swallow. This is transformation that puts us in trouble. So, they determined our names. Daniel says, what am I going to determine? Verse 8. And Daniel, but Daniel, purposed in his heart. What did he do? He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is the key to our triumph. He, Daniel, purposed in his heart. I'm asking you teenagers and uh, ex-teenagers, what did you purpose in your heart? And uh, let's see what the chief does. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse or sadder than the young men who are your age? Then uh, you would endanger my head before the king. So see, guys, I told you, there's only two options. You either give in and give up, or you step in 
and rise up. Uh uh. Keep looking, Daniel. There must be another solution as well. Remember, Ashpenaz, the chief of the eunuchs, is not hostile to you. I intentionally skipped verse 9. Look at what verse 9 says. Verse 9. And God gave, and this is the second time the expression God gave appears. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sights of the chief of the eunuchs. Also, the, the chief was favorable. What was his problem? Say it aloud. What was his problem? The, the chief's problem? The Ashpenazi's problem? What was it? Fear. That's what it's called, fear. You know, we, we, we often assume that everybody in public administration, all politicians, are creepy, corrupt crooks. And that's not true. Listen, guys, a few years ago, I decided to do a master's degree in public administration. And it got confirmed to me that not everybody out there is a creepy, corrupt crook. There are people that are good willing and willing to help. They have one problem. You know what the problem is? Fear. I fear for my bread and I fear for my head. So, Daniel, keep looking. Maybe there is a lower-ranking officer somewhere there. And he kept looking. He read, he read Ashpenaz. He understood that Ashpenaz was not hostile. And he saw there was a steward there. Somebody that was appointed by Ashpenaz and reported to Ashpenaz. I can even imagine some sort of collusion here. I'm using the word because it's trendy. Collusion. Like Ashpenaz talking to the steward, listen, if I get in trouble with the king, we're go both gone. But you report to me. If you mess up, I can protect you. You can help them. Go help them. You want the food? You can get the food. Give them what they need. Help them. God gave, because God was there. God gave Daniel favor and compassion in his eyes. I wonder how Daniel could get himself into all this messy situation. I call it tenacity. Do you have a synonym for this? Tenacity? I think that's the best word, tenacity. He knows what he was. But I'm, I'm asking, just, just like a human being, wasn't he afraid at some points? I've noticed something very interesting in the narrative. Look at verse uh, 8 first. Verse 8 first. And then look at verse 12. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile whom? Himself. Is he asking for the other brothers, the, the, the friends as well? No, for himself. But then when he talks to the steward, he says, please test your servants. Is that singular or plural? That is plural. I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe in the meanwhile, Daniel mustered up some courage, and now he became the locomotive for the rest of the friends. Or maybe it was strategy. I call all of that tenacity. Yes, he is going, they are going through some transformation, but in that transformation process, he is somebody that says, I purposed in my heart, I determined in my heart, yes, tenacity, I'm going to stay firm. But I believe when he asked the steward to help him, the steward must have asked him some questions. Like, Daniel, tell me about this. What is this really about? Why cannot you be flexible? Flexible, man. Be flexible. What is, what is actually your issue? And he says, you know, the issue is not even my issue. 
If it was my personal issue, I would be flexible. You know they changed our names. But they can call me whatever they want. I know my name. I know who I am. If I take issue with that, that's going to be my personal issue. Do you get it? Ah, somewhat. Okay, let me say something else. Um, you, you know they put us in this school. You know our preference would be for the yeshiva, for the school in Jerusalem. That's our best high-ranking educational institution. That's where I want to go and study. They put us in the Harvard of uh, Babylon. But hey, you have access with full scholarship to all the great libraries. You have access to the strolls. You can learn languages. To learn Akkadian, which is the language of the empire. You can learn Sumerian, which is the religious language, religious language. And you can also learn Aramaic, which is the commerce and political language. I would take that. Yeah, those are all opportunities. If I took issue with those, those would be my issues, my personal issues. But listen, Mr. Stewart, with T, Stewart, Stewart from Stewart, with T, Stewart, Mr. Stewart. The problem is when it comes to defiling myself, it is not a personal issue. It is a kingly issue. What do you mean? Well, the king himself has an issue with that. You mean Nebuchadnezzar? A king? No, no, no. The king of King Nebuchadnezzar. What are you talking about? Yes, my God is the king of the universe. And guess what? In one of the scrolls of one of our prophets, Jeremiah, my king, the king of the universe, calls your king, King Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. That's interesting. Come on now. Yes. It's a kingly issue. It's not my personal issue. How is it a kingly issue? Well, let me, let me, let me try to explain this to you. You know, there are things. There are things I can be flexible on. But there are things I cannot. See, my entire life, is depending or dependent on my king. The king of the kings. And there are two components to my life. There's one component that is flexible. I can stretch it. No problem about it. Because my king is flexible about those. But there's another component I could still stretch it, and if I stretch it, it will probably not break right away. The challenge is my king told us that we should not stretch those things, because those are laws. I can stretch it, somebody could stretch it, but it's very risky. Because when you stretch what God said, it's a law, then you go against the designer, you go against the creator, you demolish what the creator established. There are some rules and regulations the king himself established. But here I am. I am now under my king, the king of kings, the king of the universe, the king of your king, and I'm also under your king. As long as the king, your king, asks me to be flexible, and I can be flexible, I will be flexible. But if I start being flexible on the things that he said, don't be flexible about. That's a kingly issue. That is not a personal issue. Because my king... My king gave us some dietary laws. We cannot eat pork, 
horses, dogs, cats, camels, and some other. Come on, we don't eat those every day either. Gotcha? But here's the thing. The same king, the king of the universe, the king of kings, gave us another dietary law. He told us that even if we are to eat clean meat, when the animal is slaughtered, all the blood of the animal has to be drained. All of it. Otherwise, it would be blood defilement. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So how is that? So it means that, that you cannot go and buy meat from the marketplace, even if it's clean? Well, I can if they drain the blood. Well, you know they don't do that. I know. But how about a, a juicy steak at a steakhouse? That's so sweet. I mean, I see, that's exactly why it's sweet. Because the blood is in it, and the fat is in it, according to the dietary law of my king, both have to be removed. In the first book of the Torah, Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, this is what he says, but you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. And there are other passages where God, the king, says the fat has to be removed. Gotcha. How about the wine then? You know, I, I had some Jewish friends. I used to drink with them. Yeah. You know, what happens is that sometimes some people believe that the king, God, wasn't clear enough. So they would take and they think they can stretch but I believe you cannot stretch that either. Why? Look at this one. Wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. If I start drinking, like small quantities, will I be wise or I will be just a little bit less wise? See? See, Mr. Stewart? That's the point. I really want to be honored and be able to stand before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. But I want to make sure before I stand before the king, I can be able, I would be able to stand, to stand before the king of the king. And that's the test before the test. That's what I determined in my heart. That I, that's what I purposed in my heart. The test before the test is that I will stand in front of the king of the kings rather than before the king. So he says, please, test us. Now that I did my test before the test, you test us for 10 days. Test your servants for 10 days and let them... Give us vegetables. The Hebrew word is zeroim, which means cedars to eat and water to drink. It is cedars with reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. This is what it says. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields what? Seed. Yeah, the zeroim, the seeds. Okay. Which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields what? Seed. To you it shall be for food. That's teenagers, friends, and choices. I know there's still much confusion out there. A pastor told this story. They took their toddler to the doctor and when the, for the checkup. When the doctor saw the baby... He said, wow, what a healthy, what a strong, what a, what a fleshy baby. What do you feed him? 
And the parents said, well, we give him this and that and the other. But a little chicken? Well, not really. You know, we are vegetarians. Uh, see, that's the problem. I knew something was wrong. Look how pale he is. Look how wishy-washy he is. You know? What can you say? I could tell you that, that fiber is good for the muscle. And fiber is also good for memory. But then, then somebody may stop me. Pastor Joe, make sure you are not giving away medical advice. When the, when, uh, the pandemic hit, when it first hit, I started doing some short videos on health principles. Basic health principles. New start or creation health, if you are familiar with those. Somebody called me and told me, Pastor, watch out. You can get yourself in trouble. Make sure you're not giving medical advice. I'm not giving medical advice. These are basic health principles. They are natural healers that boost the immune system. We are right in the middle of a pandemic. Who do you think should tell the world about these realities? Some other teenagers? With some other friends? That made some other choices? You understand what I'm talking about here? We brag and we are proud about, about being uh, the church that has the health message. Where is it? Yeah. Let's see the results. Verse 15. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies, meaning flesh and some other things plus wine. Look at verse 17. Because now they were allowed to continue on the same diet. And for these four young men, God gave the third time. Yes, God gave Jehoiakim in the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. But God gave Daniel favor with Ashpenaz. And God gave them what? Knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, if somebody thinks now, that's high life, really. Those young people, those teenagers, those friends, they were just sitting in there eating uh, good zeroim or cedars meals, delicious meals every day, and just sit there like that. No, 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 no. They work their butts off. This is what Ellen G. White says in the book Prophets and Kings. True success, watch this, especially young people, true success in any line of work is not the result of chance, or accident, or destiny. God gives opportunities, and what? Success depends upon the use made of them. That's the key, how you use what God has provided. And then you jump to the end result. After the three years they appear in front of the king, let the king see if they can stand or not before him. Can they stand? Yes. None of the young people their age was like them. And something more, verse 20 says, verse 20, and in all matters and of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times, this is the Hebrew expression, he found them hands better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Hence, better. That's the Hebrew expression. And you have the ten fingers there. That's why it was translated with ten times. The test before the test. Fifteen years ago, a class of seniors from a high school, 
from a Seventh-day Adventist high school from here from the United States, came over on a mission trip to Romania. It happened to be right in the church where I grew up. I grew up in that church, and they were building the church building at that time. So this group of uh, seniors came over to help with the building of the church. My conference delegated me to go and uh, offer translation and uh, some sort of management for the group from the local church side. I wasn't the church's pastor. I was pastoring another district somewhere uh, three hours away. So I went. Everything was wonderful. On our way back to Bucharest, to the airport, to the capital, it was a 10 hours drive, bus trip. We stopped at one place where uh, most of uh, those that visit Romania want to go. It's Dracula's castle. So we stopped there to, to see the famous castle and uh, to eat something. We were hungry. So everybody looked for food, and we lined up at different food uh, kiosks. And I was standing there, last person in the line. Everybody was buying something. The two guys before me, two students from the same yeshiva, from the same school, one orders and he says, please make sure it doesn't have pork. The other orders and says, please make sure it does have pork. <laughs> and I'm like, Woo, what is this? Okay, and now, your fantasy can go in all directions. Grace and truth. All right? Grace and truth. But here's my question. You think the guy that said, make sure there is no pork in it, made that decision on the spot there? Was that his test? No. He had determined, he had purposed in his heart way, way before. That's the test before the test. To purpose in your heart before the test from the outside comes. Make the right choice, the invisible right choice, before you could even make any visible bad choice. We often celebrate those that in their youth or early in their lives live, abandon God, or just, just go their ways, and then they come back. Should we celebrate that? Absolutely. That's a celebration of God's grace. But let me ask you something. Shouldn't we also, also celebrate those that never go away? That's what I would like to do right now. I would like to ask those teenagers and ask those ex-teenagers that have friends and make choices. Those that want to purpose in their hearts. Do you want to purpose in, their heart, in your heart that you will not defile yourself? Who would like to purpose in his or her heart that you would not be defiled? Yes, that's the test before the test. The entire book of Daniel is about tests. But this is the test before the test. Life from now on, listen to me, life from now on is going to be test after test. Believe me, test after st test. But this is the test before the test. Amen? Amen. By His grace. Amen.